I want to introduce uh, Professor Marty Subramanian, who is going to chair uh, the next panel. Marty, uh, over to you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Dick just mentioned, I'll be moderating the panel discussion on the implications of climate risk for derivatives, uh, risk transfer markets, and insurance. We have a distinguished panel with us today to discuss an issue of great import to the world in the coming years. Um, it has already uh, seen, had its impact uh, in geopolitics for the past couple of decades. How will climate change, especially the risk of climate change, uh, affect the many institutions, corporations, and regulatory bodies that form the bulwark of modern industrial society? Our focus, of course, will be on derivatives, uh, risk transfer, and insurance, but these issues really cut across so many areas uh, that I think virtually every discussion we have today is somehow tempered by uh, concerns about climate change. So climate change and its risk will affect every aspect of human activity and are of great concern to everyone. Uh, the Paris Agreement, which we have recently rejoined, um, was the culmination of many such efforts to correct some of the adverse trends that have been unfolding for, for decades. Climate change is no longer a matter of opinion, it's an established scientific fact, though reasonable people could disagree over the pace of change in different parts of the world and the particular risks posed by such changes. Our panelists will have a lot to say about these risks and how to contain them. Unfortunately, we will not have much time for questions uh, given the short time at our uh, disposal. But if you have some burning questions that you'd like to post to the panelists, please post them in, chat box, in the chat box and we'll see if we can get to them. So without further ado, I will proceed to introduce our panelists. Uh, first is Madeline Antonchik, who is the CEO of the Global Algorithmic uh, Institute which is a, a NGO. She was previously the treasurer at the World Bank. And Jérôme uh, uh, Hegley, I don't know if I'm saying the last name correctly, is the group chief economist of Swiss Re, uh, giant uh, reinsurance company. And the third panelist is Mike Kreidler, insurance commissioner of the state of Washington. So let me get straight to the uh, high level questions first, and then we'll get into more detailed issues. My first question is addressed to Jérôme. Uh, Jerome, uh, what is the economic impact of climate change? We hear a lot about climate change in different quarters, but what are the, at a high level, what are the important economic aspects? And why do we need risk transfer, transfer for uh, climate risk and to contain climate risk? Thank, thank, you, Dr. And, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, very distinguished uh, panel. And thank you all uh, for participating in and looking forward to a great discussion. Well, first of all, what is the economic impact of, of, of climate change? Uh, bottom line message from our latest uh, study, which we just uh, released uh, last week, which is called Economics of Climate Change. No action is not an option. Uh, our conclusion is that the economic impact of climate change, it's really huge. It's number one risk for the global economy. We estimate that the global economy under its current temperature path which is about 2 to 2.6 degree, which is not what uh, the Paris Agreement targets, right? The Paris Agreement targets uh, the temperature increase to be below 2%. We estimate that the global economy on its current temperature path with today's pledges will be around 14% smaller in 2050. That's the baseline scenario. Uh, according to our novel approaches uh, out there, uh, the, the report we just issued uh, last week, we believe that uh, the global economy is at threat to uh, decline even further and at risk uh, to be about 20% uh, smaller in 2050 than it otherwise uh, would be. Now, if, if you allow me, Marty, very, very briefly, why is this a novel approach? This is a novel approach uh, because we take the scenarios from the RCP, the representative concentration pathways from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC uh, climate change scenarios into account. But not only do we take these into account to drive our economic scenarios, but we also take into account of omitted 
variables that we should focus not just on, on, on the mean, actually quite the contrary, we should focus on the fat uh, tails. The uh, fact is uh, with taking into account uh, not just chronic uh, physical risks, which usually you see in the model, but also taking account of acute physical uh, risks, as well as the geographical location of countries, uh, uh, together with wet and dry climate uh, scores, you get much more integrated and comprehensive uh, global economic uh, uh, picture. We look at 48 uh, countries representing 90% uh, of the world economy, so the up to 18% uh, impact for the global economy for 2050. I really believe this is even more on the conservative uh, uh, side. If, 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 if you look at the US, um, given uh, you're, you're based in the US and uh, given we just had the climate change summit driven by the new administration in, in, in the US, fact is, uh, according to, to our calculations out there in public domain, for the US at today's likely temperature rise of about 2 to 2.6 percent, the US would lose about uh, uh, 7 percent of its uh, GDP. In a more severe scenario, and this is not unlikely either, in a more severe scenario of a temperature increase of 3.2 percent, the loss of GDP for the US would be close to, to, to 10 percent. And uh, these, these are all uh, big numbers. Most exposed is actually uh, Southeast uh, Asia, which uh, given its geographical location uh, would be exposed uh, to losing about a quarter of its GDP by mid-century. And uh, within, uh, within Asia, also China, very much, uh, very much at, at, at risk. You, we also rank countries. The US uh, out of 48 uh, countries is number seven. Canada and Germany still among the top 10 least uh, vulnerable countries. But as, as, as we all know, similar like, like with COVID-19, we need the global action, global cooperation. Uh, so that's why being uh, amongst the top three or top five least vulnerable countries, it's uh, no reason for not being inactive and not being inactive nationally, but also internationally. Well, Marty, you, you, you also asked, uh, why do we need uh, risk transfer for climate risk? We need risk transfer for climate risk uh, because at the end of the day, we need both public and private uh, action. And because the climate change is true systemic risk, number one risk for the global economy. Maybe, maybe, maybe you can allow, allow me just two minutes in terms of um, the, the, the key principles we think uh, is really important uh, for the risk transfer of climate risk. I think first of all, it is transparency and the disclosure of, of, of climate risk, which is paramount. And this is why we put out uh, uh, this, this, this research uh, uh, last week. Uh, we need transparency. What are the costs uh, out there? We need uh, private uh, companies to disclose not only that there will be net zero in 2050, but also show the pathway uh, to it. Because only if you have the transparency and disclosure, then you can price it and you can transfer it to, to capital markets or you can tax it, but you can also then only make sure that you have a mitigation mechanism in place uh, and that the mitigation mechanism in place is driving you to the outcome, which is, should be all for us, bringing Paris closer to us. And with Paris closer, I mean, obviously the Paris Agreement. Number one uh, for the need for, for transfer of climate risk is, is, is transparency and dis disclosure. Number two, definitely in terms of uh, the risk transfer solutions, um, we all will need a menu of uh, policy uh, measures. Definitely, I do believe uh, carbon tax will need to be part of it. I also believe there's a lot of talk about uh, uh, and a lot of interest. It's number one interest in Europe, uh, and it also has become one the number one interest, uh, I think, for the um, investment management industry, which is ESG. I think we, we, we need to make sure that this whole menu of policy measures doesn't stop at carbon tax. And maybe there's going to be uh, also kind of a, a harmonization of, of what we mean with, with carbon uh, tax. But we also need to make sure that ESG and with it sustainable finance doesn't remain to be a niche market. Let me just give you one statistic, but then I have one point I will close. <laughs> one statistic, green bonds, it's 
everywhere in the headlines, green bonds and ESG, obviously. But green bonds, fact is, only 2% of the bond market are actually climate aligned bonds. So sustainable finance is still very much niche. So, so with this, my last point is uh, definitely transparency, disclosure and reporting key to price the risk of climate change in private and public sector uh, balance sheets. Only if you have that transparency, will the market as uh, previous speaker Nancy so eloquently highlighted with, with the research, research that she put out there. Only if you have the transparency, will the market also be able uh, to move. Um, uh, Jerome, could you please uh, briefly comment, uh, briefly I emphasize, yeah. on what the impact would be on the insurance industry and what the industry can do about it? Well, briefly, think... Because I want to get Commissioner Kreidler's uh, views on this. Uh, well, very briefly, I think for the insurance and reinsurance industry, no question about that. We are in the eye of the storm in terms of, in terms of mitigating climate change risk. We are both involved on the underwriting side, right? Uh, the underwriting side uh, is um, you, you have annual renewers, so it's we embedded into our uh, risk models. Uh, you have the so-called secondary periods, which are much more difficult uh, uh, to model and to, and to catch, but definitely lots to offer on the underwriting side. Um, and on the asset side, let's not forget, insurance industry is our long-term investors. Fact is, we manage about, uh, as an industry, we manage about $21 trillion. So the transition risk, the exposure uh, of, uh, of climate change on the asset side, there we also are very much exposed, but also have very much to offer of how we are being positioned. And last but not least, and then I will close, what we have to offer is also, I think, the knowledge uh, capital, being on both sides of the balance sheets, uh, needing to uh, navigate and understanding uh, climate change, needing to integrate it into the risk models, and then putting the knowledge out there and working with our clients, working with the governments, and also working with the states. I will close here. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jerome. Let me turn to uh, Commissioner Kreidler. Mike, could you give us your views on... Uh, as an experienced regulator, the insurance industry's connection to uh, climate change and responsibility for action from your viewpoint as a regulator. I, I'd have to reflect uh, what uh, Jerome just said. I, I, it has a profound, insurance plays a profound role. If you take a look at economic activity in any society, they need to reassure the lenders and the investors that, uh, that, that, uh, that they're not throwing their money away. Uh, and that means you have to have insurance to, to back you up. So, you, so the insurance has the, the obligation to make sure that they have really uh, assessed the risks involved with a, a particular uh, in, uh, uh, enterprise uh, so that when they do uh, issue uh, insurance policies to them, uh, they can stand behind them. And uh, if they can't get that kind of assurance, uh, it's not going to go forward. Uh, so it, it, the impact is just absolutely, absolutely pro profound in that sense. I, I think that it's the role that insurers can play going forward is to how they can impact what's transpiring right now. Uh, they, they, Rather than just be uh, uh, innocent observers, uh, they play an incredibly important role in being able to incentivize the system to make adjustments. It's not good enough just to walk away and just say, no, that risk is too much, or we're going to charge unreasonable rates that are going to make uh, this uh, uh, unreasonable economic activity uh, uh, proceed, uh, and to do so after it's already established. Uh, they need to be prospective. They need to be involved early and, and making the kind of changes that uh, really make a difference. And I, in the US, it would be fantastic if we started to move toward what uh, is commonplace in the European Union, which is the all perils policy. Uh, I think that's something that uh, would make a lot more sense in the US, particularly around flood. Uh, but uh, other risks are involved there too, but principally flood. Um, if you can get away from the federal government being involved, uh, it, it offers us a real incentive uh, to, to, uh, uh, to, to get the private market heavily involved early, making judgments as to whether this is a good 
uh, enterprise or that they want to be behind or not. Uh, so incentivizing um, uh, po policyholders too, uh, so that they take the kind of uh, steps to mitigate the, the their exposure is incredibly important. Hardening their property so they're less likely to be uh, at risk. Uh, they need to be involved with uh, land use practices. The insurer does. Not a historical activity, particularly in the US, uh, where you have the separation of insurance and, and, and banking. Uh, so it's a, it's a different world, um, but they need to really be in a strong position here to, to uh, uh, be, be involved at the, at the ground uh, level here when it comes to uh, land use and uh, building codes and, and the like. You just can't sit back and wait and say, oh, isn't that terrible that they didn't have stronger standards? No, they have to be there at the table uh, making sure those things are, are transpiring. Um, at, the, at, the, at the lending level, um, there really needs to be a full disclosure um, and some, and if there is full disclosure, particularly from the standpoint of the lender, who is going to have keen interest in, in this, but also uh, from the standpoint of the insurer, so that they're not a here today, gone tomorrow type of, of enterprise. It has to be one where it's uh, sustainable. Uh, parametric uh, insurance uh, shows some opportunities in this area too. Um, Insurers really do uh, uh, have an obligation here to disclose um, to, to, with, with a high degree of confidence just exactly uh, uh, what, what they're doing, how they're doing it, and they can play an incredibly important role here in seeing uh, this transpire. Um, one of the things that uh, we've been doing here in the US uh, for over a decade now uh, is to have a through the insurance commissioners is to have a disclosure requirement on the part of insurers. Have to admit there were some dark days there where we kind of did it uh, under, the, under the cover of darkness, uh, but we did every, uh, with along with several other states, uh, surveyed all of the insurance companies, major insurance companies in the US. Uh, now it's been taken over by the NEIC as an activity uh, that they'll they'll embrace. So it's really we're really seeing a morph here. For it was a kind of a, a pull out uh, four years ago from the Paris Accord and uh, and the like. Now you're really starting to see a change take place, both for the insurers, from the lenders, but also in the broader society. Uh, and 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 that is uh, really an indication that a member organization like the NEIC now is moving forward and embracing. Uh, these kind of changes as they go forward uh, and doing the survey itself. And that, that uh, is clearly in our best interest. At the international level, we're seeing that, uh, that the, the NEIC has become involved uh, much more aggressively uh, of late in the last uh, year in particular uh, at the international level where they have joined uh, uh, the, the, uh, the sustainable insurance form uh, and to become very active there with the forum. Um, in addition to that, there's also the the uh, uh, the role that, that we're, we're that we're playing right now with uh, uh, the uh, IAIS, the International Association of Insurance Supervisors, um, and, and uh, working closely together to make the kind of changes that uh, need to take place. So. This is one where insurance plays an incredibly important role and it needs to do so on an international basis and need, needs to work collaboratively in ways, quite frankly, we, we haven't seen in the past, but it's going to be one that's going to be in, integrated really very firmly as to how we go forward. Thank you, Mike. Uh, let me now turn to uh, Madeline for uh, a discussion of the broader economic impact of climate change on the world economy. Madeline, you've had uh, a lot of experience from your uh, perch at the World Bank for many years. Uh, and given all that is going on around the world, um, clearly the developing economies, the emerging economies are gonna be hit the hardest. 
uh, in terms of natural disasters. I mean, the, uh, there was uh, the other day I saw a report about Bangladesh that a big chunk of the population will be affected and will have to will be displaced. Can you tell us a little bit at a broad level uh, uh, how countries are thinking about mitigating climate-induced uh, catastrophes uh, and really the broad risks that uh, humanity faces today? Yes, thank you. Uh, so firstly, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to join the panel today. Uh, yes, in fact, um, middle income um, uh, economies, uh, their average economic impact of disasters is more than 10 times that of high or income economies and 10 times in terms of a percent of their GDP. And for small economies, the loss is even larger. You know, we've seen 100%, 200%. If you look at what happened with Haiti and with uh, Grenada in, in not too distant past. So first, let me just mention some of the costs um, of natural disasters because they are multidimensional. So first, obviously, you have the humanitarian costs, the costs associated with rescue and recovery. You've got the indirect infrastructure losses uh, and then, of course, reconstruction costs. But you've also got really importantly, the supply chain disruptions, and that impacts the entire world. Look what's happening right now with Taiwan. They are the biggest global supplier of computer chips, but they have a major, major drought. Half of their supply of water comes from typhoons. And with rising temperatures, typhoons become much stronger over the Pacific Ocean. But what's happening is they change the course and they're not hitting Taiwan. So Taiwan is causing an enormous impact globally, obviously for themselves as well. And what they're doing is they're alleviating the water shortages through dredging reservoirs, desalination, and of course, now they're even rationing water use. So there's multiple drivers behind the significant growth in natural disasters, especially in the emerging and developing economies. And we're just talking about climate change, but they're really much broader than that. So first there's the, uh, of course, there's climate change. You've also got environmental degradation. You've got population growth, which is a huge issue. Urbanization, which is very, very significant, and density of urbanization. And then um, of poorly managed growth, poor building codes. Many countries don't even have building codes. If they do have building codes, then they're, they're not enforced. And of course, there's still continued weakness in countries' national governance. So urbanization, as an example, is a particular concern in Africa. Africa has got 1.3 billion people, and it's projected to double by 2050 but more than 80% of that increase is gonna be in cities. So that is a huge risk in terms of, you know, the impact of um, natural disasters. So what are countries doing? Well, firstly, they realize they're exposed to substantial fiscal instability, not only due to the rescue and reconstruction, but also due to lost employment, lower taxes, business disruption, lost productivity. Uh, and then secondly, of course, there's a growing availability of the necessary tools. So there's new models, that they can use for decision-making. And of course, there are alternative ways to transfer that catastrophic risk. So they've been moving from ex post to ex ante responses. So that's prevention, preparedness, and fiscal resilience. So for prevention, they are building dikes on riverbanks. They are uh, revising building codes, reinforcing public buildings. Early warning systems are being put in place. And this has been especially important. Japan is very, very progressive. Not, they're not a developing economy, but they're very progressive in terms of uh, the catastrophic risk um, measures. And they had long ago put in place the early warning systems. And in fact, it was a powerful, powerful thing for them when they had the uh, 2011 earthquake and then the subsequent tsunami, um, because the bullet train, which I don't know if any of you have been on it, but it is enormous long and fast. And um, that shut down instantaneously. Once the earthquake hit, not one car was derailed, not one person was hurt because of the early warning systems. So, um, so prevention, then they have preparedness. And that means in many ways, in many times, they are taking out um, catastrophe risk contingent lines of credit. And then for financial resilience, they're engaging in risk transfer. So, um, so what's their approach and what kind of risk transfer? So countries take what we call a tiered approach. So they match the risk layer with the various risk financing instruments or approaches. So for example, they assess the probability of an event and then the severity of that event. 
And then the tiered approach they take is based on the layers, the, those risk layers, which helps them assess what kind of risk to keep, what kind of risk to transfer. So for example, uh, high risk layers, which is where you have a low probability of an event, but it has a very high loss severity, so enormous tail risk, they would, which would include, for example, a major earthquake or cyclone or droughts, um, they would either use weather derivatives, insurance, reinsurance, or cat bonds, or insurance linked notes more laterally. Um, for medium risk layers, which is sort of the medium probability of occurrence, along with obviously medium loss of severity. So for example, floods, minor earthquakes, um, they would use contingent lines of credit. And then for the low risk layer, which is uh, those that have very high frequency, but a very low um, uh, loss severity, such as localized floods or landslides, uh, countries use their reserves. So the increased availability of modeling and the financial instruments help countries transfer a portion of those uh, risk exposures to the market. Now, unfortunately, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that some countries have actually moved backwards um, with changing administrations. And Mexico is a great unfortunate case in point. Mexico for 15 years has um, been very progressive in terms of all of their uh, catastrophic uh, risk um, uh, implementation measures. They were the first to ever do multi-peril, multi-regional. So multi-peril meaning both uh, earthquakes and hurricanes on the East Coast, on the West Coast. Um, and uh, it was the best social program that they had. Unfortunately, with the new administration, maybe six months ago now, um, they redirected all the funds and have shut down the hedging, at least the catastrophic hedging. So, because um, there is a very large political issue within emerging economies in terms of, of using uh, funds. So for example, there's always the debate um, with a politician, why would I wanna use a, um, uh, any kind of funds that are obviously of limited um, supply to buy insurance or to do some derivative, which is gonna cost me a premium, when, it's, when that is using some sort resource that if there's no event, then we just wasted that money. And of course, when I would talk to these countries, I'd say, well, that's like saying, I wish my house burned down because I bought insurance and nothing happened. So, um, but unfortunately um, that political issue does exist. And as I said, uh, it's very unfortunate to find out how Mexico that was really a, a leader in this space has moved back. But then again, there's many, many countries, especially Southeast Asia, and others where they uh, continue to implement these kinds of um, tools. So I'll stop there. Thank you, thank you, Myra. Um, uh, let's now turn to more specific issues relating to risk transfer. Uh, Jerome, what, where, where do we need risk transfer precisely? And where do we need insurance? Uh, how do we actually make sure that the private markets are developed and deployed in the right manner in the coming years? Uh, I'm, uh, first, I'm going to turn to Jerome, and I'm going to ask the same question of Mike. Thank, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Marty. Um, if, if you look, um, where do we need insurance, right? Uh, let, let, let me draw your attention of the overall figure for natural catastrophes. Fact is 76%, and please think about that, 76% of all economic losses of natural catastrophes globally is unprotected. So if you look at the key perils, um, be it flood, uh, uh, be, 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 it, um, be, it, be it hurricanes, uh, you, you are extremely exposed uh, globally. And the, if, if you look at uh, where the, the biggest uh, exposure is, fact is the biggest uh, natural catastrophes in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, where you're exposed and where you're not covered is actually in Northern America. And uh, this is closely followed regionally by emerging uh, Asia. If you take all numbers uh, uh, together, uh, fact is uh, you have about uh, almost a quarter of a trillion dollars, and this is in premium equivalent uh, uh, terms, which is not uh, not being covered. So a lot of natural catastrophes uh, and uh, and the key perils. Uh, fact is uh, we are not uh, we are not covering it. And uh, again, as as, as Madeline. Uh, uh, very well uh, said, you are exposing uh, uh, low to middle income households or governments. Um, if you, 
if you just permit one, me one comment, you're also exposing a lot of um, uh, low, uh, um, low and medium income developing uh, countries when I think about the G20 initiative with the DSSSI. I, I, I would wish to see a much more connection of the DSSI initiative with, uh, um, with allowing to have the resilience which the insurance commissioner also uh, talked so much and, and very well. We need to have the, the insurance before the event is, 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 is happening. So natural catastrophe, it's, uh, it's a global phenomenon in terms of not having the protection. And actually it's, it's close to home with the largest uh, uh, unprotect, unpro not protected economic losses actually being in Northern America. For Northern America, our latest figures indicate about 60 billion in terms of premium recurrent terms is not uh, being uh, protected. And, and, and globally, again, one quarter of a trillion. So huge, huge, huge numbers. Happy to talk more about that. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you Jerome. Uh, Mike, your perspective on risk transfer and insurance and how will private markets be developed and deployed? I, uh, th thank you. And, and uh, you know, the, the magnitude in the US of the uh, of the investments of the insurance industry are are are, are tremendous. I mean, we 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 sit out there with uh, uh, something in the area of seven trillion dollars uh, in U.S. Uh, insurance company investments. So this is this is not inconsequential. And if that 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 money is applied uh, with in appropriate incentives, uh, green technology, uh, urging uh, and incentivizing the the uh, uh, and recognizing the investments being made in in uh, in all electric vehicles and uh, other types of, uh, of of green actions that can be taken. There's huge investment opportunity that's out there for the insurance industry, and the challenge is really going to fall on, on 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 regulators to make sure that. Uh, just because uh, we don't have coal-fired electrical generation bonds uh, to require the, as a very stable uh, place to make investments, which are a lousy place now, uh, but uh, were at one time just 20 years ago looked at much more favorably in the insurance world as very secure and and, and risk-free. Uh, let's let's see if the same kind of regulators now make sure that they're recognizing that green technology out there and the opportunities that, 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 that are available, um, particularly given the, the, the uh, magnitude of the uh, investment portfolios that are held by US insurers. Uh, and, I, and I think the other is certainly is to, to really have uh, um, the, the right kind of incentives here for, for property owners going forward so that they so that they, they, they take uh, steps to, to, to mitigate the, their risk. Uh, I like the investment portfolio because that's really getting at the core of what we're talking about as the drivers uh, for climate change. Uh, I like the mitigation so that we're, we're not stymieing uh, in investment and economic activity uh, by not recognizing what clearly are going to be uh, great opportunities uh, going forward. Um, Innovative ideas in regulation are possible. Uh, one of them is, is certainly how can we tie uh, uh, insurance uh, portfolio over here to something other than just one year with a particular uh, client uh, that it could have an extended period of time. If you can do that for an extended period of time, the uh, higher cost associated frequently with uh, hardening um, against uh, climate change uh, can be absorbed if there is some assurance there that that they're, they're, they have a lengthier period of time. And in the short term, yes, uh, uh, there's potential for costing more, but you have the benefits here of going for a longer period of time uh, with that insurance coverage. That's not out there in the market. It's also that uh, uh, that we may, may develop some kind of coding system so that uh, that you know that as an insurer, when you go in, is this going to be uh, uh, gr truly green or is this going to be something much less than that? Uh, so that there's some kind of coding system uh, that is readily available. I think all of these, these require uh, regulatory changes 
that, that come hard in an industry that is very staid, very conservative, uh, but it's conservative to, in order to protect investment. It'll be at liability risk if it doesn't take chances and recognize the changes that are taking place and the regulators behind them need to be cooperative. And that's gonna be a challenge, but of absolute necessity to go forward successfully. Thanks, thanks, Mike. Uh, Marty, just to follow up, really you, yeah, go ahead, Mike. Marty, I'm gonna add a couple of things here. Um, uh, in terms of the losses, there has been, in aggregate, $5.2 trillion in losses due to catastrophic risk since 1980. Um, and of course, you know, Jerome is exactly correct. Uh, you know, and that means 24% is not covered and it gets covered by or absorbed by countries, companies, and people. But in the emerging and developing economies, the insurance coverage is even less, um, and under 10%, and in fact, most of the times it's zero. So there's a couple of implications of that. Um, firstly, uh, if you look at the amount that's going to be needed to achieve the SDGs, uh, the UN predicts that it's a two and a half billion dollars a year. OECD predicts for the Paris Agreement, six and a half billion a year. A lot of that is infrastructure. A lot of that goes into emerging economies, which is not going to be covered by insurance. There is no insurance market to speak of at all in the emerging economies. And um, if you look at, um, according to UNCTAD, more than 50% of FDI over the last several years that goes, you know, FDI in total goes to developing economies. That means that is not covered by any kind of insurance. Um, one more point I want to make that um, uh, Jerome made, and, and this sort of made me uh, smile, and that is, you know, the, le the U.S. is the least covered. Um, I remember during Hurricane, well, during Hurricane Harvey, in fact, Mexico was so sophisticated, they had coverage for, they take coverage, or until they change, for, you um, U.S., not just Mexico. So their region covers Arizona, Texas, certain areas, a couple of reasons. Firstly, remittances. If there is a hurricane or a problem in the U.S., that's going to hurt their economy from remittances. Secondly, the pipelines. So they were covered while the U.S. was not covered. And I remember after that incident happened, I reached out to U.S. Treasury. I know I had died there. And I said, this is an embarrassment. You know, Mexico is so sophisticated and they're having insurance on our disasters and we don't even do any natural disaster uh, hedging, which is really, it's, it's an embarrassment. Thank you. Um, Mike, um, from your perspective as a former regulator and uh, a former legislator, now regulator, um, I mean, there's obviously a lot of scope for collaboration between the private and public sectors. And I mean, the un unless the two pull together, I think this is not going to work. How do you see the two collaborating as we move towards a less carbon intensive economy? Uh, I, I, I really have a, a strong sense that uh, at least in my fairly small world, and I, and I got out of uh, Switzerland just, just before they shut down Switzerland uh, uh, at the end of uh, January, as I recall, uh, kind of like the last flight out, so to speak. Uh, or we're, and it, and it, and there, there's a there's a there's a great opportunity here to to in the U.S. Uh, that is starting to really start to manifest itself. That the U.S. is really viewing things quite differently. Um, now, I, I recognize that many in the international community look at the U.S. right now and say, yeah, you're here today, but will you be here tomorrow? Uh, given the past four years and pulling out of the Paris Accord and the like, uh, I think things, some, some major transition has taken place and that there's, this is one that goes much further than than just uh, the insurance companies or just the regulators. I, it's was something that is palpable in society. And that's where it has to be in the U.S. in order to make it acceptable to the, uh, to the elected officials so that they're not running counter to some, some uh, diatribe that's coming from uh, the, the far right uh, that uh, is saying we, we can ignore uh, climate change. Um, that, that being the case, I sense right now we've turned a corner on this and we're going to start to see uh, some real change coming forward.
Now, uh, I think it's going to have to be collaborative. Uh, you can't talk people into making investments and making and and make and uh, um, on, on just uh, a pipe dream. You have to be able to back it up, uh, and you have whether it comes to maintaining insurance policies so that they remain available and uh, in a competitive environment, uh, and at the same time the price is reasonable. Those are going to be drivers, uh, but at the same time. I think you can do it together as long as we all recognize we need to do this as a, to, uh, together uh, in a unified fashion. You can't be out there, everybody uh, doing their own thing. Uh, you can't be an insurer that's here today but gone tomorrow. Uh, you can't come in and say, okay, we'll insure this risk, but you know, it's only a risk we're going to insure for one year, period. You know, you, 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 this is one where We've got to have some sustainability. We've got to re reward the kind of procedures. And that means a change in how we regulate and uh, in establishing standards. And those standards are going to have to be one that the insurance industry recognizes as being in their best interest along with uh, that of the regulator. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got to leave it at that. Uh, thank you, Madeline, Jerome, and Mike for a great discussion.